Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is Goes Down the Sky and Telescope series. And I'm very happy to have Sky and Telescope author Brian Ventrudo with us today. Hi, Brian. Hi, Frank. Uh, great to be here with you. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to talk about your very lovely article. Uh, let's see. It is November 19th, 2021, as we're doing this shoot. And Brian, where are you located at? I am in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, about a 24 hour drive north of San Diego up the I-15, if you ever care to make it. <laughs> I think you've done that drive before. <laughs> so that would put her to roughly about the same as Phoenix. So I'm in, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and we are getting our very typical uh, pre-winter weather. So it's very nice. So we do get a lot of Canadians coming down. We get a lot of snowbirds coming down. Uh, from Canada into Phoenix to enjoy the uh, a little bit more milder winter than we might get in Calgary there. Um, so is there snow on the ground yet in Calgary? We, we do not have snow yet, actually. It's a pretty uh, pretty late onset, uh, onset of winter so far. It's been a nice fall. Sky has been good. Um, you know, seasonal, a little bit warmer, so we can't complain. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, is there snow on the ground yet in Calgary? No, no snow at all. No, we're, we're, we're doing okay here. Okay. Cool. Uh, looks like over your left shoulder there, you've got an instrument with a sort of a light shroud on it. Yes, I've dragged my telescope out here to keep it away from some dust in the basement right now. So that's, we're going to talk about small scope observing. That is not the telescope I no, use. No, that's not too small. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a 10 inch Dobsonian that's taking refuge up here right now. So very cool. Very cool. So Brian, what do you, what do you like to do in astronomy? Well, I've been doing astronomy a while on and uh, quite a while on and off. Um, mostly I'm a visual observer, as you can mm -hmm. glean from, from this article. Mm -hmm. um, in the last year or so, I've gone over to the dark side and started to do a little bit of astrophotography just to see what all the fuss is about. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it, it is kind of fun. I mean, I do love it, live on the edge of the city, so there's still light pollution. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with the right filters and so forth, uh, even on a moonlit night, you can take some decent images, um, mm -hmm. you know, with, with a little bit of uh, practice and effort. So it is kind of fun. It gets me out. And, you know, even on nights where, where I wouldn't otherwise be visually observing, it, mm -hmm. it's nice to learn a new technology and some new, new techniques. Very cool. And we've done a couple of Sky and Telescope uh uh interviews with authors on their articles who are very into astrophotography and so maybe we'll put a link to those in the in the description down down below the video so it's always cool to learn something new and try something different so very absolutely, good absolutely yeah for sure and that is going to bring us to this very lovely sky and telescope article on small scope winter and brian take us away yeah so i've got a thing for sm small telescopes i mean when i like a lot of astronomers, I guess, when I first got into astronomy as a kid, that's all I could afford. And big scopes were unusual back then. Um, I then took a long break from astronomy, uh, basically from probably my early 20s until maybe my mid 40s or so. So I got into it maybe 12 or 13 years ago. Okay. And when I got back into astronomy, I started with a small telescope. Uh, I started with a 66 millimeter uh, ED refractor, you know, with mm. an apochromatic element. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed at the view through that little telescope. Now, a lot of things are, are fairly dim, um, but the image quality was really good. And so I was quite, I, I kind of caught the refractor fever. I enjoyed the, the refractor experience, you know, looking at the nice pinpoint stars and so forth, especially if you had dark sky. So, you know, I experimented with a few other refractors and eventually settled on a, an 85 millimeter teleview refractor. Okay. Um, and I took that out to dark sky wherever I could, um, certainly in Calgary the last few years and also uh, when I was in Northern Virginia before that and, mm -hmm. and, and Ottawa before that, whenever I can get out of the city. And I was pretty amazed at what you could see. Now, of course, things were never as bright as they were with, you know, my 10 inch Dobsonian or sure. an even bigger telescope. But I started to challenge myself to kind of figure out what looked better through a small telescope than mm -hmm. through a bigger telescope. Okay. Now, by better, I mean um, one of the key advantages of a small telescope, well, it has two really. One of the advantages is that it's small and so it's easy to handle, mm -hmm. uh, easy to mount, easy to drag out, um, you know, the door. Uh, so there's, there's less resistance to observing. Mm 
But the other advantage is that it has, because of its shorter focal length on average, it's got a wider field of view. Mm. So I started to look at my star atlases and just sweep the Milky Way to find out what looked better in, uh, in a small telescope than a big telescope. And by better, I mean you can see large objects and also groups of objects mm -hmm. uh, as a consequence of the wide field of view. And by wide field, I'm talking, you know, two, three, maybe four degrees, depending on the telescope and the eyepiece you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, go ahead. Let's go ahead and slide down. Yeah, and just to uh, pick up your point there on on portability, yes, the best telescope you will ever own is the telescope that you use. <laughs> that, that is absolutely right. That's, that's absolutely right. And I, I have definitely uh, more than once talked myself out of buying, you know, a 16-inch Dobsonian. Mm -hmm. um, I remember my last experience wrestling with my conscience. I was at a star party in Northern Virginia, and a, a guy was giving me a tour of, you know, uh, he had a big obsession, uh, Dobsonian, beautiful telescope. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it took about 20 minutes to set up with a, with a helper. And I thought, oh, I guess I could do that. And then I looked at the, at the car he was using and he said, yeah, yeah, I needed, to, I needed to buy this Toyota 4Runner to pick, you know, pack the telescope in. And I thought, wow, that really adds to the cost. <laughs> <laughs> just a so little I, bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that just wouldn't go over. Right. So, um, so I stuck with a small telescope and, and started exploring with it. Mm -hmm. So yes, the, the one you use for sure. Now, um, so this article about small scope observing in the winter is a companion piece to one I wrote for small scope observing in the summer um, about two years ago mm -hmm. all, all, for Sky and Telescope. Uh, now, summer in a sense is easier because you've got the thick band of the Milky Way. I mean, there's tons of stuff to see in the summer. When you scan the Milky Way with a small telescope or even binoculars, it's hard not to see something good. Winter is a little more challenging because we're looking mostly away from the center of the galaxy, still along the plane of the Milky Way, where mm -hmm. most of this article happens. So okay. there's still lots of things to see. Now, the kinds of things to see here, um, they are, a lot of them are beginner friendly. Um, a lot of things here I've seen, you know, 100, maybe 200 times, mm -hmm. some less so, some are a little trickier. Uh, especially if you need a view of the southern sky. But um, to make it easier, we just started off here mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, a marquee object, a double cluster, yeah. which isn't terribly small. I mean, it fits in a two degree field of view. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a beautiful object in any telescope that can, that can take both of these uh, in at, at a single glance. And um, so it lies in the constellation Perseus. Pretty much anyone, anyone of anyone who reads Sky and Telescope in the Northern Hemisphere can find this. Uh, really, starting in October, late at night, and you know, right into the early spring, in the early evening. So it's a very accessible object, mm -hmm. and you know, just beautiful. And the, the thing I like about the double cluster, it's really one of the few objects of its kind anywhere. And when I see an object like this, it's one of the few objects objects I can see that um, where I don't feel bad. I live in the southern hemisphere, you know. Like usually, there's lots of good stuff to see down there, but yeah. this is one of the real showpieces of of the northern hemisphere. Very cool. And it's a you know it's an immense object. It's young. It's huge. As I mentioned in the article, if it was about the same distance as the Pleiades, it would fill about a quarter of the sky. So it's really an impressive object. Lots of color. Nice. You know, for a visual observer, it's just spectacular. Cool. But, um, you know, if someone can manage a, a bigger field of view, you can move down to the star uh, uh, Mirfak, Alpha Persei, mm -hmm. and see it's a, a, the attendants of Mirfak, uh, I call them, which are formerly part of the Alpha Persei moving group. So, you mm -hmm. know, sort of a star cluster, they form together, they're still moving together through space. Yep. Uh, again, it's a beautiful object if you can manage a, a four degree field of view, like nice, bright, young, blue white stars, mm -hmm. just a lovely, you know, a lovely object for visual observing. You know, for someone who just likes the aesthetics of astronomy, these, these two objects are just spectacular. Lovely. So these are the kinds of objects we're talking about, like Alpha, yeah, the double cluster you could probably see with a six or eight inch telescope. But things like the Alpha Persei moving group, you need you need short focal length, wide field of view. Yeah. yeah. Now, 
<laughs> there is uh, also in, in Perseus, uh, the California Nebula. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. just a beautiful object for astrophotographers. Um, and not a terribly difficult object for astrophotography, but seeing this visually is really, really difficult. So it's extremely, has extremely low surface brightness. You need absolutely black sky. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably a narrow band filter, like a, an H beta filter that will yeah. let through hydrogen beta light at, what is it, 486 nanometers or so. And even then, you have just just you know a, a chance to glimpse the brightest part of, of the nebula but just seeing it you know is a, is a good challenge it's a good challenge yeah yeah it's uh, it's not an object for beginners I, i've just barely glanced it in in uh um uh, in a slightly larger refractor i think i saw it through a 92 millimeter uh stowaway refractor once at a star party so yeah it, it can be done mm -hmm. um but it's it's tough okay and we got another one up here, stock two. Oh yeah, stock two, of course. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, with the double cluster, if you can manage a wider field of view, you'll see a little kind of where your cursor is there. There's an arc of stars that goes yeah. from the double cluster up to kind of a, It's it looks through an eyepiece like a stick figure. It almost looks like a stick figure man without a head. Okay. Um, and other people see it like, you know, a guy doing that. So it's called the muscle man cluster also. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I, I could, I can see the headless guy through a telescope for sure. Okay. The muscle man, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But again, if you can get a four degree field of view, this is really nice. So, and just to see that little arc of stars coming up through, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's very nice. Cool. So these are the kinds of things you can see, you know, and if you want, you know, you can look at each of these things. A lot of people, when they first start to look for a couple of minutes and say, oh, yeah, that's nice. And they go on to the next thing. But these are objects like with a small telescope, you can really savor them. You know, like, yeah, I'll look at the double cluster for half an hour. There you go. And, you know, look for different, and especially nebula, like especially brighter nebula. And you can wait for moments of steady seeing or when your eye gets more. Yeah. Acclimated. You know, more, yeah, conditioned, you know. It just takes a lot of patience to, to mm -hmm. see some, especially these fainter things. Well, that's good to hear, right? Not everything has to be this, uh, you know, hit and run. Saw it, move on, next one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that has its place, I suppose, and I, I do it sometimes, too, especially when it's, you know, minus 10 degrees here in the winter time. These are winter stars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, you can linger over these. I mean, there's enough in this article really to, to take you through uh, several weeks of observing if you like. Nice, okay, cool. It looks like we've got a couple down here in uh, Auriga, Capella. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, you know, a, a really nice patch of the Northern Milky Way here. Comes up through Taurus and, and Auriga you know, mm -hmm. down from Perseus. So we're getting a little south along the northern Milky Way here, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in my opinion, you've got the little, the three Messier objects, 36, 37, 38. 37 is just a beautiful cluster. But uh, if you want a single field of view, you know, staying with the philosophy of the article, where we're trying to, you know, see things within a single field of view of a small telescope, yes. we're looking at M36 and M38, which you can fit in. Okay. Um, you've also got another vista with, uh, you can see a little bit of the, the flaming flaming star nebula. If you've got a nebula filter and just really black sky, you'll just get a hint of a nebula here. Nice. Much, much more interesting objects for astrophotographers, but just to see this is great. Mm -hmm. And we've also got um, A.E. Arage here, which mm -hmm. is uh, um, lighting up the flaming star nebula, mm -hmm. and which itself is an interesting object. Um, very prominent. I, I think it's what yeah. put myself on the spot here it's either fourth or sixth magnitude but this star astronomers figure um started in the trapezium star cluster you know in the center of the orion nebula and uh, it was probably you know a bright star in a binary uh, a close binary and it interacted with another set of close binaries mm -hmm. and flung one of the stars out so this this star is just, it's just cooking through the interstellar medium here. It's come a long way in the last several million years and now finds itself in, in Arage. So, I mean, that's kind of a, 
kind of a cool little thing here. Mm-hmm. Lots of proper motion on that one. It's moving. Yep. Nice. Very nice. Okay. So you slide down a little bit. There you talk about M36, M37, Prissy Eye, and then we come to the Seven Sisters. Yeah, I mean, here, here the, I had to give it away, of course, halfway through the article. I, I actually had to call a spoiler alert when I was looking at the Orion Nebula. Could really, it's, I mean, other than maybe um, Eta Carina in the Southern Hemisphere, this is a, especially the sort, entire sort of Orion, like this is as good as it gets. You know, even, even total beginners will look through a telescope at uh, the sort of Orion and also the Pleiades and think, okay, where can I buy one of these things? <laughs> you know, kind of gets them into it. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the, the Pleiades itself is just, is just beautiful. Yeah. Now, of course, it doesn't look like this when you look at it through a telescope, even a really good uh, small refractor. You don't see, um, you might see a hint of the nebulosity, just this, mm -hmm. this blue reflection nebula mm -hmm. or Amarope here, but mostly you're just seeing stars, okay? So the, the Seven Sisters turns into, you know, maybe 150 sisters, right? <laughs> and, you know, and you, you'll see some color here, a lot of blue white stars, but you'll see some orange stars here too. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, some some uh, orange uh, and red red giants and so forth that are starting to evolve off the main mm -hmm. sequence. Mm -hmm. So it's just a beautiful object. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if you, you can manage a, a three degree field of view, it frames it really nicely. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's hard to get, if you get tired of the Pleiades, and uh, and the Orion Nebula next. I mean, it's you know, it's time to take a break from astronomy. Really, <laughs> that's, that's a good litmus test. You can't appreciate the beauty anymore. Yeah, okay, let's uh, let's take a break. Yeah, which is fine. You know, I mean, that that does happen to all of us. It's happened to me in the past. Thinking, okay, I'm freezing. I've seen this, you know, fifty times. Maybe I'll take up photography for a few years. But then. <laughs> But then one day you drag your telescope out and you have a look at these things and you get right back into it again. Mm. Yeah. Let that go. Very nice. And what do we got here? We got, ooh, a nice big one. Yeah, this is a more of a close-up of the Orion Nebula. Now, I mean, I guess if we had eyes like owls, I mean, Orion might, the constellation Orion might look a little bit like this. Yeah. So you've got this beautiful supernova remnant uh, the uh, over on the left side um, uh, Barnard's loop and you'll see some nebulosity here mm -hmm. around uh, the star Aln attack. Okay. So you see the flame nebula. Yeah. So if you aim a small telescope here, you'll pick up the flame nebula for sure, which is a kind of a combination emission reflection nebula. Good. And yeah. then of course you see the horsehead nebula, which you're not going to see with a small telescope, unfortunately. Yeah. But you see some, just some beautiful stars here. So you can see, uh, the three stars of Orion's belt, which if you can manage, you know, four or five degrees look great in a small telescope. And mm -hmm. you will see the flame nebula also. Mm -hmm. And you see this beautiful S, kind of an S-shaped group of stars uh, between Min Mintaka and all in the lamb. You'll see like a little snake of stars. It's not yeah. as prominent here because you see a lot of nebulosity. Yeah, and this one. There's just, yeah, there's just tons of stuff to see here. And this image was taken actually... Um, the editor at Sky and Telescope, uh, Diana Heinekeinen, uh -huh. asked, um, yeah, she's great. She asked, um, you know, who, if I had any suggestions for astrophotos. And this one is by Terry Hancock, who does just beautiful wide field work. He's in uh, at Grand Mesa Observatory in, in Colorado. Uh -huh. he just does some amazing work here. Terry, that's a shout out, Terry. Yeah, yeah, he does uh, very nice work. And then, of course, the sword itself is what you can see with a small telescope. So you've got multiple pieces of nebulosity here. You've got M42, which is the main event, of course. Mm -hmm. Looks like a giant bat wing shape through a telescope. You know, kind of greenish, even, even in a small telescope, you'll see some color. Mm -hmm. And then M43, just uh, just north of it. Uh, beautiful, you know, and, and this, so this is all part of the, uh, you know, the Orion Star Factory, I think people call it. So right. stars are just churning out here. So mm -hmm. you see newly minted star clusters like to the north of the nebula, NGC 1981. Uh -huh. um, and then you'll see these double stars to the south of the nebula, like uh, Struve 7, 747, for example, okay. Iota Orionis. Like it's just, just beautiful. You could spend all night looking here. 
I encourage people to do so. Just fantastic. And then, you know, if you want to power up, you can also have a look. It's not labeled here because I didn't mention it in the article, to be fair, but Sigma Orionis, if you can find it, just, uh, oh, yeah, it's just so it's just below. It's the bright star below and to the right of Alnitak. And it's a it's a beautiful multiple star for a small telescope. Like you can see four or five components, Ooh, um, you know, at moderate to high magnification. Yes. And these are all, you know, they're they're in motion. These stars, it's a, you know, it's a real multiple star system. So mm -hmm. lots to see, lots to see in Orion. Eclipse. Cool. Very cool. And we talked about the Pleiades. We talked about M42, the Running Man, and then we come down to you and oh, I. Yes. Unicorn. Oh yes, the Rosette Nebula. So so yeah, Monoceros. Um. You know, it's, it's a pretty dim constellation, but there's lots of deep sky objects here. And I guess the showpiece is the rosette, mm -hmm. which astrophotographers just love. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was reading reading through the, the history of observing the rosette nebula, and it was a real challenge object visually for a long time. You know, especially before the advent of uh, visual nebula filters in the, in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, you know, people could barely see this, like with 10, 12, 16 inch telescopes. Wow. So imagine my surprise when I took my little telescope out to the suburban Washington and, and popped a ultra high contrast filter into my t brand new at that time, Teleview 85. And I could see a good chunk of the Rosette Nebula. And I thought, wow. oh my God, I was so excited actually. I had, I emailed Al, Al Nagler and I said, Al, I could see the Rosette Nebula who makes, you know, the, the president of Teleview mm -hmm. and, or, um, you know, the founder of Teleview. And I said, I could see the Rosette with my Teleview 85. I'm so excited, cool. <laughs> you know, and, you know, mostly you're, mostly you're seeing a star cluster in the middle here, but there's definitely, you can see arcs of nebulosity around the cluster. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. What's so this the, is um, this is another you know it's another star forming region just adjacent to uh, to uh, to Orion. I think it's a fair bit farther away and intrinsically larger, but it's just a beautiful object. Mm -hmm. So you know when you can see stuff like this through a little telescope, you know, and it doesn't have to be a an expensive telescope by any means. You just mm -hmm. have to know where to look. Yep. Get to get to dark sky. Get a filter, and you can see this stuff. What's the inset here in black and white? So the insets are, um, right. So the insets are different parts of the nebulosity. So they, they were kind of cataloged separately. It's not like someone came along and said, here's the rosette. It's going to be NGC, whatever. They saw little bits of it at a time and they mapped it out separately. So I think it's actually made of uh, you know, three or four. Uh, or three, I guess here we're showing three, three bits of nebulosity with a cluster in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then surrounding it again are more newly minted clusters. So these are our colander clusters mm -hmm. named after the Swedish astronomer Per Colander, mm -hmm. who cataloged, I forget, 130, 140 something star clusters all around most of the northern sky and the near southern sky. So we've got four colander clusters here, which are can be seen, um, yeah, if you've got a, you know, three, four degree field of view. Mm hmm. You know, and you know, like any star cluster set against really nice black sky, it's just beautiful. Sticks you know, right. The, the, you know, the, the diamond dust on velvet uh, cliche, but it, that's what it looks like. You know, it's just beautiful. That's a great analogy. I like that. From the rosettes, and there we go. And now we're going to run into more of the rosette. Yeah, that's, uh, that's Terry's view of it. So, I mean, it's just a, I think, you know, to be fair, and I mentioned, I think in the first or second paragraph of the article that this is by no means just for visual observers. So I think, you know, astrophotographers, uh, if they use a short focal length telescope and a big camera, a big sensor camera, they get a four degree field of view, no problem. So everything on this list is, is a, you know, a, a worthy target for astrophotographers for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. As you can see, what Terry has done with the uh, with the rosette here. So, so you said you were giving uh, astrophotography a whirl. So, what are you using? What are you using right now for a camera? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So, um, I first started out. I guess you could call it. They call it EAA now, or electronically 
mm. assistant uh, astronomy. Mm -hmm. And that's for kind of near real time viewing. Now you don't focus so much on image quality, but you 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 look through your telescope generally with a small sensor camera. Okay. So people started doing this, you know, maybe ten years ago with, uh, uh, especially with a, a, the Mellencam cameras. Okay. Uh, that are they're, they're kind of like live video cameras mm -hmm. that you can actually you can hook them up right to a to a monitor and see the images live like a TV monitor because you get a video signal. Mm -hmm. So I, I did that, you know, maybe 10 years ago or so, but the image quality, it was so, so. Mm -hmm. But um, with the new uh, CMOS cameras now from companies like, you know, ZWO and QHY CCD. Mm -hmm. um, I, so about a year and a half ago, I started with their small sensor cameras, like the 290 MC, which is just a tiny sensor, but really easy to use. Great for real time imaging, super sensitive. And then of course, you know, from there I start getting into I started getting into larger sensor cameras. Yeah. So my favorite right now is a ZWO camera, the 533 MC, which is pretty popular. Mm. Especially with Instagrammers, because the, the sensor is square. So it's you know, it's a one to one ratio, tailor made for Instagram. <laughs> and um but I'm, I'm using, uh, and I have used some DSLRs also. I modified a, a DSLR to, you know, make sure it's sensitive at, at H alpha. But mm -hmm. these have like a really big field of view. And like I do at the edge of the city, when I use cameras that big, you're, you're kind of fighting gradients in the sky and, you know, the effects of light pollution and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as telescopes go, again, I keep, keep the focal length short. If you're going to start off in astrophotography, Keep the focal length short, you know, 400 millimeters or so, or even less if you can. Okay. Uh, it makes it easy to, to find things. You don't have to worry so much about, you know, rigorous auto guiding. Although I, you know, I do, I do get into auto guiding. It's not as hard as it looks, especially with some of the new software out there. Yeah. But yeah, keep, keep the focal length short and then you'll get nice wide fields like this, like we're seeing mm -hmm. with the, the rosette here. Yeah. You know, if you don't want to start off with an 11 inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain, <laughs> and it's a, a small sensor camera. You're never going to see anything if you're just starting out in astrophotography. Right. All right. You want that field of view. Yep. Cool. So let's slide down. It looks like we got some Geminis. Yeah, Gemini is great. It's kind of cool. You know, it's a, a long constellation. If you look at it in dark sky through a pair of binoculars, you look up towards Castor and Pollux, and you don't really see many background stars. Mm hmm. And then you kind of follow it down the length of the body to the feet. And all of a sudden, you know, you're in the Milky Way again. You're in the Northern Milky Way. Yeah. So there's star clusters and nebula here. You know, M35 is just a beautiful cluster. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, you know, it's fine. It's fine with larger telescopes too. But if you get a bigger field of view, you know, you can also get this, uh, this little dimmer cluster NGC 2158 in. And if you get a really wide field of view, you can also mm -hmm. um, look, look back into Orion and, and see some nebulosity up there oh, okay. uh, to the north. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's a very nice part of the sky for sure. Cool. Very cool. Now we talk about that and we talk about some of the southerly Milky Way. Stars. Yeah. So, so now, now he's, now we get into Southern envy here. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so from, so a lot of the notes I made for, for this, uh, for this article were made when I lived in the, the Washington, D.C. area, ah. which is what, the, you know, the latitude's about 39 degrees. Mm -hmm. And I would go even even south. So, you know, I made some notes from the Winter Star Party in 20, uh, 2017, I think I was down there. You know, so you're, you're down to 29 degrees. And you get beautiful views of, so, you know, south of Sirius. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, there's lots of star clusters. You start to ride into a really nice part of the Milky Way through Canis Major and Puppis. Mm -hmm. And then you get into, you know, Carina and things like that. Yeah. Now, from my part of the world, 51 degrees north, all the aurora are great here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But it start, it's starting to, starting to get hard to see star clusters. Um, yeah. But there's some real gems here. So you go down south, um, south of Aludra. Uh, you know, Eta Canis Majoris, and you see a lot, you know, these two little clusters, uh, Colander uh, 132 and 140, 130, uh, sorry, 140 and 132. Uh -huh. And then you keep, you know, keep going down if you can. 
and you know a lot of your readers will be able to get down into Puppis and see uh, M46 and M47 are, are you know they would rival the double cluster in many ways they fit into the same field of view of a small telescope no oh, okay um, I, I'm more partial to NGC uh, 2451 and 2477 Okay. Now, they're not as uh, rich clusters as 46 and 47 and certainly not like the double cluster but yeah. you know the main stars are just beautiful and the background here is spectacular like just a spectacular star background in the milky way like uh you know I, i'm a star guy I, I got into it just just by uh you know looking at i always love light and stars more than galaxies like i'm not a deep deep fuzzy guy really Right. You know, faint fuzzies like galaxies and planetary nebula the stars are just beautiful and you're going to see some really nice stars down here yeah I like fantastic stars. i like stars very cool so yeah diana cut me off after this i couldn't go any further south and you know what <laughs> we can't see much from much more south and from north america but this this is some of the best stuff right down here through Puppis if you're going to have a small telescope and again you know a small telescope you could pay a few hundred bucks for one it doesn't have to be an apochromat but just a you know 400 five 600 millimeter focal length and a good wide field eyepiece mm -hmm. you can see some really amazing stuff nice. nice nice so that's kind of the philosophy of the article and again the one i did i f um, i forget the year exactly but uh um the uh, uh the small scope summer one was the same philosophy mm -hmm. and there you know there you like your the article was limited by length you know you could go on for twice twice as long there's just so much to see in the summer sky with a with a small telescope sure very cool very nice so yeah i mean people that are stuck with small scopes or they're bored with their small scopes i was hoping both these articles would give them a little inspiration to start looking for things you know their own favorite wide field vistas that they could see visually or astro astrophotographically you know, that look better in a small telescope than, than in a large telescope. That's kind of the philosophy of the article here. Do you remember the month or the year when the summer, um, the summer small scope article came out? Um, I am drawing a blank. Oh, it, it's actually, if you go back up to the top, it's referenced in this article. Ah, okay. Let's yeah. The top. Next page. Sure. And where are we here so it is in august 2019 and okay very good small scope summer ah there we go very good cool we'll put that in the link too brian i want to thank you so much for walking us through this very lovely article on small scopes well it's been my pleasure it's been my pleasure frank sorry if i got carried away but i, I do like this stuff <laughs> chat away that's what we're here for absolutely <laughs> wonderful so um you may, kind of hinted at it a little bit maybe in some direction so so where do we where do we go from here are you anticipating uh taking an extended trip to the southern hemisphere and doing a pair of articles uh in the southern hemisphere on small scopes do you have uh, other articles or other books coming out? Because I know you, you do some writing. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, the first one, I had my telescope packed and ready to go for a trip to Chile nice. in April of 2020. Not good. <laughs> and we started to hear about this, this virus going around. And my not wife good. says, we're not going to Chile. I said, no, yeah. it's not going to be that bad. It's not going to be that bad. And we didn't go to Chile. It was, it was that bad. <laughs> it was that bad. Yeah. So yeah. that trip's that trip is still in my future, and I would de cool. definitely bring my my little refractor down there. Very nice. Um, in terms of articles, I do have one uh, in the hopper for next summer. For again, for an observing article, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to have a look in and around the constellation Ophiuchus, if I'm not mistaken, okay. around a little asterism that always interested me it's called taurus poniatowski it's this little Dummy it looks like a little bull-shaped face just off the i think the the eastern side of ophiuchus and there's some star clusters around there there's some double stars like barnard star is around there mm -hmm. a lot of close double stars so so we'll cook that one up for next summer cool. and then uh, i'm also i'm also trying to screw up my courage to, to pitch a, a science article uh, for sky and telescope also i did one of those last year on stellar archaeology which was uh which was a lot of fun yeah 
um, about looking at low or low low metal stars mm -hmm. in small galaxies around the Milky Way to try to figure out how these galaxies formed. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm looking at another another science article on uh, yeah I remember on stars that that, uh, that uh, when I get a bit of time I'll pitch. Yeah, I remember the uh, stellar archaeology because it, it was nice, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a very very interesting subject. <laughs> a very interesting. So I mean, they're taking spectra of these you know, 15th magnitude stars with 10 meter telescopes, mm -hmm. and you know, like multiple nights just to get a spectra of one star. I mean, that is one expensive spectra. <laughs> it is. <Yeah. laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. Those time allocation committees that it's worth sitting on for that long because yeah. I forget. Yeah, what yeah they, they were very persuasive, very persuasive for sure. And yeah, I do write a bit about astronomy. I've got a astronomy blog or a website called cosmicpursuits.com. Yep. Where uh, I, there's a backlog of articles and uh, or a back catalog of articles, and I still post once or twice there a month, mm -hmm. and have a monthly newsletter to, Good. you know, to my my diehard fans, so to speak. So we'll put a link to that below the video as well. And if you haven't checked out that uh, uh, that website, go do so. It's it's pretty cool. I did spend a couple hours browsing through it. So very nice. Very cool. Yeah, thank you. Well, Brian, thank you so much for spending some time with us and chatting about your astronomy and your current article and your past articles and your future articles. Very good. Uh, my, my pleasure, Frank. It was great. Great to be here. Well, thank you. That'll do, everyone, and we will see you on the next one, and I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. Bye-bye.